heaven is more than a destination it's really to be motivation motivation because to know that we'll be there and of course uh, from our very beginning going back to uh, the study several months ago as we began we talked about the fact that how uh, Daniel's prophecy and John's revelation go hand in hand together uh, and what they do is they give us a timeline of end times events again Daniel telling us exactly to the very day that Jesus would arrive in Jerusalem, what we call Palm Sunday, and he would be hailed to the Messiah, but then he would be cut off. But he would be, again, uh, persecuted, uh, he would be killed, and he would, he would rise again. Uh, John continues on and tells us about uh, what would happen after that up until these final days, what we call the tribulation period, the return of Jesus Christ, setting up his messianic kingdom, uh, and we compared it to sometimes we read Isaiah, we read Jeremiah, we read Ezekiel, and we're like looking at pieces of, of a puzzle and, uh, and trying to see where it fits in the prophetic picture. But if we understand these two books, then they, it's kind of like putting those border pieces. Once you get the border on, you kind of get the color group set up. Uh, you can begin to place things in and get a, understand the big picture. And I think it's uh, helped us do that. But as we come to the end here, again, there's some uh, important things that still need to be said. We've spent a couple of weeks looking at the, uh, the heavenly city. John says, I, I, uh, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then he spent some time uh, in great deal describing this heavenly city that you and I will live in uh, at one point in time here in the future. Uh, and uh, closer than we, we suspect. I want to look at a couple of passages before we begin. One is in uh, Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, talking about Abraham, because the patriarchs, these men and women of the Old Testament, again, they were waiting to see this city, uh, even as you and I are waiting to see it, but we know a lot more about it than they did. But uh, it says of Abraham, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which, was, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was promised what became the land of Israel, and uh, he lived there. It was wonderful, fulfillment of the promises of God. But at the same time, the whole time he was there, he still was a shepherd. He still lived in a tent, and uh, he knew that this wasn't it, and that he was always anticipating being with the Lord in a city that you and I have just been studying about for the last couple of weeks. Later down in verse 13, talks about the patriarchs and says, uh, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and that homeland isn't here. <laughs> and so uh, promises, uh, we've been studying about them. We've been looking at them. Uh, it's what we're to live for. We're to consider ourselves to be pilgrims, simply passing through, uh, not taking uh, you know, uh, things of this world uh, with too much late, uh, weight, keeping a light touch on the things of the world, because after all, one day uh, we're going to be with the Lord for all eternity. Uh, even, even Jesus on the cross was encouraged by the fact uh, that the joy set before him, our salvation being with us for all eternity uh, was what was on his mind. And certainly the, what we see in the book of Acts, what we read in the epistles, what we read about the, uh, of the church through the ages is they lived with the idea of the soon anticipation of Jesus Christ that he would come for the church at any time. And that's what we're to be living for as well. well let's look at these final recommendations from the angel that we uh, inter got introduced to some time ago that's in a sense taken John on this, uh, this journey, verses 6 to 11. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. 
And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you not, do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and your brethren, uh, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. So six recommendations, and the first ones is to take these words as faithful and true. So what God has to say, what's been revealed to John, all these things that we've been studying about, uh, we are to take them as being, being faithful. God will keep his promises. The visions of the events recorded are genuine or they're true. It means that they're, uh, they're reliable. Uh, and it includes what we call the sixth beatitude of the book, all the blessed is he, uh, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Uh, so uh, again, similar to chapter 1, verse 3, that same kind of idea. Uh, we don't want to be like the, the man that James talks about who looks in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. We don't want to do that with, with what we've been uh, studying over the last several months. Keeping the saying the prophecies of this book means to guard over, to watch over, to preserve uh, intact. And uh, our main intent in studying prophecy has got to be more than we know more than most people what's going to happen in the future. Those guys in the news at night don't understand what's going to go on in the Middle East. We know, we know exactly what's going to happen, which of course we do. Uh, you'd, you'd all do a lot better than most of the experts on there. But, uh, but that's not why we study prophecy. It is fascinating. It is amazing. It is interesting to know that, that God has spoken these things in advance and it just clicks, keeps clicking right along. Every, everything he says is going to happen in the future uh, keeps happening. And we live in those days where we watch Russia and Iran align together as Ezekiel said they would be. Uh, all these things that are, uh, that are happening and it, it's, it's amazing to watch it. But it's got to be more than that. It's supposed to impact our lives. The revelation of Jesus Christ, who he is. The line of the tribe of Judah who will return uh, to their, this earth to establish his kingdom. Uh, and again, it's supposed to motivate us in terms of faithful service and, and really the purity of our, our own lives. Now, uh, Jesus in Matthew 24, talking about these future events, said to his disciples, Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. And again, the parable. It's like a, a master that goes on a long trip, but he leaves the steward in charge. When he returns, will he be faithful? Will he be doing what he's supposed to be doing? So... Uh, knowing prophecy, knowing what's supposed to happen is not supposed to cause us to put on white robes and move to a mountaintop and, and uh, know that the Lord is coming any day and kind of check out. We're actually supposed to be faithful in doing the things that God's called us to do. We're going to see in our text, one of them is to make sure we're taking the gospel uh, to our friends, neighbors, and, uh, and family members. Uh, same writer, 1 John 3, 3, John says, and everyone who has this hope of uh, this future with Jesus uh, in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So it's supposed to uh, make a difference, again, because it's, it's not just a destination, it's a motivation in terms of how we live our lives, how faithful we are to obeying God's word, how we live it out in front of others, and certainly uh, the purity of our own lives. The second recommendation is to understand that these events will happen suddenly. Uh, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. We'll find those words three times in our uh, in our text. And there's two ways of taking this. One is sometimes we think that that's a when question. When will Jesus come back? Quickly. But it's really a how question. How will Jesus come back? Quickly. <laughs> you know, because we look and say, well, you know, it's been 2,000 years since John recorded this. Uh, uh, how quick really is quick? But uh, 
Well, in terms of uh, the, the redemption of mankind and the history of, uh, of this world and so forth, uh, to God, 2,000 years is probably not a very long period of time, and, uh, and we should look at it that way and live with the idea that he's going to come back, could come back at any point in time. Uh, and, and certainly the disciples, the apostles, they, they live that way. I mean, of course, very early on in and, and, uh, and chapter uh, 1 of the book of Acts, uh, Jesus is still with them right before his ascension, and their, their question is, but when are you going to establish your kingdom? <laughs> it's like, 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 this is going to happen any day here. And that's not a bad way, way to live. And certainly we saw them live their lives that way, uh, and the church, uh, Lord, that has, the church that's following the Lord's will has continued to live that way. But you and I live in, in a day and age where we should be more excited than any other generation. Because of the things that we see happening with Israel back in the land again after 2,000 years of their absence uh, in 1967, establishing Jerusalem as their, uh, as their capital and fulfillment of the prophet uh, Ezekiel. Uh, as I mentioned, an alignment that has never existed before in history of, uh, of ancient Persia or Iran with, uh, with Russia. And we, we continue to see that and talked about on the pages of uh, of the papers and in the news nightly and what that might mean in terms of missile defense systems and, uh, and so forth, which is, uh, again, one of the reasons, one of the, one of the problems we're having, if you watch the president sign that uh, nuclear arms treaty this week, one of the issues, one of the sticking points is Russia saying, and this means, uh, you know, we, don't, we give our, our, our ancient rusting <laughs> weapons and you give up something good, and by the way, we don't want you to put a missile defense system to protect anyone against the missiles of Iran. So these things that uh, are in the Bible or in the news that, uh, that you and I look at each and every day. Isaiah said that there would be a point in time when, when all the nations of the earth would, uh, would turn their back on the nation of Israel. His words, it would be a cup of trembling to the rest of the world. And certainly we live in those days. And uh, in the events of just uh, this last couple of weeks, and even this morning, uh, uh, reflect that. Uh, we have, for the very first time since 1948, in a sense, uh, uh, turned our back on the, on the nation of Israel. And you're probably aware of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and his visit to Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago for uh, conferences with uh, our president, in which he uh, refused to have a press conference, refused to meet with him in public, refused to have a meal with him, all of these things. We've, re we've heard about it some in our own news, but the news in Israel and the Jerusalem Post and other riser are, are, are calling our president, first time in history, anti-Semitic. Uh, it was a diplomatically a complete slap in the face. This is one of our key allies. We treat our enemies better than that when they come to visit uh, Washington, D.C. We host big dinners for them. We have big press conferences. Uh, they ushered them in the back door, out the back door. And, uh, and the people in Israel were very upset about this. And certainly even a number of members of Congress. Uh, there's, uh, I saw an interview with uh, the former mayor of New York, uh, Koch, who is uh, basically, uh, again, he's a Democrat. He campaigned for uh, President Obama, and he's going through Jewish committee, uh, communities from New York to Florida now apologizing uh, because he urged them to uh, vote for him, and he's astounded at what's going on. These, things, these events have never happened before. These are in the last couple of weeks. This morning, I read news uh, from Jerusalem, the fact that there was a nuclear summit meeting coming up in two weeks in which Israel would be there, Benjamin Netanyahu would be there, and it was to deal with the concern over nuclear terrorism, that terrorists could somehow uh, get a bomb. There's a concern over North Korea, over Iran, as well as any other uh, folks out there that uh, are, are the bad guys that might want to get one of these weapons. Uh, and basically, uh, the concern at, of Israel going to one of these things is that this thing may turn on them because they, uh, they have nuclear weapons. They are in, in the Middle East, and they have sought to do whatever they need to in the past to, to defend themselves, and we have always supported them in that, and that's changed. And that's changed, and they let uh, Netanyahu know that, and now he has pulled out of the conference because he sees that the United States will not back Israel, will not support him in this conference, and they will, in fact, allow Turkey and some of the other Islamic nations to come after him. So this morning, uh, Netanyahu announced that he would not be able to, he would not attend this conference Things are changing in the world, and they change pretty quickly, don't, don't, don't they? 
Uh, and that's part of what Jesus is saying. When events start happening, they will happen quickly or suddenly. It's not a matter of when, it's how. How will they happen? They will happen very, very suddenly. Uh, and again, uh, there's the recommendation to understand the times that you're living in. I am coming quickly. Again, chapter 1, verse 3, John had said that early on. Blessed is he who reads uh, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is, is near. The third recommendation is to accept the words of the prophecy. John gives a testimony very often. He says, what I saw, what I heard. It's, it's what God gives and reveals. Uh, the angel delivers and takes John to see different things, and then he passes it on to, uh, to us, and he's saying he's been faithful in doing that. We should accept the words of this prophecy. And fourth, there's a recommendation about uh, worship. John seems to get caught up, and, uh, and we don't blame him, and uh, the vision and what he's seen and all that he's taking in, and he once again falls down on, on his face before this angel. It's the second time, and of course, the angel suggests that that's a really bad idea and that the last angel to let somebody do that uh, isn't here anymore, and would really encourage you to like get up on your feet real fast because I'm just your fellow brother uh, in this, and, uh, and you should worship God uh, and worship God uh, only. And of course, in your notes, I've got a reference there to Hebrews 1, 1 to 14, because there the writer points out the fact that Christ being superior to angels is the only one worthy of being worshipped. So if only God can be worshipped, and the exhortation is to worship Jesus, it's because Jesus is, uh, is, is God. Uh, the fifth recommendation is to not seal up the book. And uh, if you're a student of Bible prophecy, that certainly... Uh, you know the contrast with Daniel because in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, after uh, so many things are revealed to Daniel about future events, he says, now seal up, <laughs> seal up the prophecy for a future time until the last days. And now we're in those days because the exhortation to John is, is basically, uh, it's again, revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Don't seal these things up. Because you're living in these days. You're going to see these things come about. This is relevant to your life as a New Testament believer. Because Revelation presents the person and the character of Jesus Christ like no other book. Important to study his life in, in the Gospels. And we, we study verse by verse through books on, on Sunday morning, which kind of makes us a little bit, uh, a little bit unique. Uh, and, uh, and, and what we try to do is, is certainly covering the Old Testament and the New Testament but we try to make sure uh, from time to time we get back to one of the Gospels because we need to know the life and the teaching of Jesus as well as his death and resurrection. We try to get to the epistles uh, periodically as well, like we will next week, because they tell us how to live the Christian, uh, the, the Christian life. But we can study all of those Gospels. We can study the prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. But Revelation is very different in terms of the picture of, uh, of Jesus. And I think we've seen that over and over again, the descriptions of him, his power, his majesty, his glory, his blazing eyes, uh, you know, the, the white garments, all the things that, uh, uh, that we've seen in here. Again, it's, uh, I think it's meant to, to, to have us a, that different view, more of a fear. You know, there's such a, we place a, a high degree of emphasis on the grace of God, and we should. And the fact that God loves us, uh, each, uh, each and every one. And he has a plan for our lives. We can come to him uh, every time. Uh, but uh, the Old Testament says it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. And that, that means it's the beginning of, of your understanding. And really to understand God and have a relationship with him. Yes, we need to understand his grace and his love and his mercy, but we're supposed to fear him. You know what it says, you know, when it says to, uh, to fear God? That means you're supposed to be afraid. <laughs> I, know, I know sometimes we say it's important to have a reverence, uh, you know, this fear of God. It means to, you know, this respect and, uh, and everything. Yeah, it's supposed to, but it means you're supposed to be afraid. When it says fear God, it means be afraid. And sometimes we don't really get that, you know, in our teaching now in the New Testament. But if you've been here with us for these studies, we love Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He's, he's the friend that will stick closer than, than a brother. We could go on and on, and we're to fear him too because he is the holy God, a righteous God. And when he returns to planet Earth, 
there's, there's judgment day coming, and then he will establish his kingdom. And John's, John's given us some insights that we just wouldn't get from uh, any other book. So the angel says, don't seal up this book. It's, it's for right now. This is what believers need to understand. It gives us a whole different dimension in terms of the climax of God's plan for the ages. The sixth recommendation is, is to repent. Verse 11 is a, a solemn warning. I don't know if you notice that, the contrast here. He who is unjust, let him be unjust. And then notice the word still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. The contrast is the person that's unjust versus the person that's righteous. The person that is filthy versus the person that is, that is holy. Uh, and the emphasis here is that it's just going to kind of continue that way, which is kind of a scary thought. Uh, again, we probably have friends and family members. I've probably said this to myself one time. I mean, I grew up in the church. I, uh, I, I at least knew about Hal Lindsey's book, Late Great Planet Earth. I never read it, but I had to hear everybody else talk about it that I, that I knew about it and, uh, and that uh, God's prophecies were, were coming to, uh, and taking, taking place. And uh, but, you know, there's always that thing in the back of your mind that, yeah, well, you know, when I, you know, if a bunch of people certainly just disappear like the rapture, then, you know, then I'll really know, and then I'll, you know, then I'll really get it together, and, you know, and then if I see some guy take over uh, the world, and they, we go to a cashless society, you know, then we'll really know, and then, you know, yeah, I'll really become a Christian then, because it'll be beyond doubt, and, and, and what's suggested here, at least, is that that may not happen. Uh, that the tendency is that if you're unjust, you're just going to keep being unjust. And, and if you're, you're filthy in terms of our sin and our standing before God versus the righteousness that God gives us, though, though our, our sins you know, be uh, you know, red as crimson, he can make us white as snow, uh, that the tendency is that we're going to keep doing what we're doing despite the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Uh, that, uh, that if you're going to come to faith in Christ, come to faith in Christ. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. And there's somehow this thinking of, of some people that, that I can be almost saved and then kind of be on the edge as though that's real fulfilling. <laughs> that, uh, that I can do that and then, and then when something happens, then, then I'll really know. And this is kind of a uh, I think meant to be a wake-up call. It's been said that uh, decision, decisions determine character, and character determines destiny. There's a certain amount of destiny that seems to be fixed uh, at some point in, uh, in time. And then again, the, the, the contrast between these things of what it is to be in Christ versus not. So final recommendations from the angel. Notice the final revelation from Jesus in verse 12 to 17. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride, that's us, say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So final revelation states again that Jesus is coming quickly and that his reward is, is with him. So uh, again, the, the unbeliever who does not place their faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross will be judged, we saw before the white throne judge. Remember, they're gonna be judged according to their works. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a deeper place in hell for Hitler than, than there is a person that was just a good moral person but, but would never make a commitment to Jesus Christ. God will be equitable even in his judgment uh, and when we see it and how he orchestrates that judgment we're, we're all going to go right on that's uh, that's fair that's equitable i i don't know how else god could have done it i wouldn't have thought it that way but again uh, we'll see that people are judged according to their works 
at the great white throne judgment. Remember who's sitting on that throne? It's Jesus. At the same time, believers will stand before the Bema seat of Christ uh, and uh, that judgment. And again, the Bema seat is, is like at the Olympics when they're playing the national anthem and those people are standing on those platforms. They're, they're getting their gold and silver and bronze medal. That's, that's where that word comes from, the Greek. That's the Bema seat. And so we'll be judged according to our works and we'll be given uh, uh, awards as well. We don't, you know, something we don't really really think about it. It's kind of a mind-blowing concept that God would save us out of our sins and then, and then you know, do this work in us and then change our hearts and our desires and change our motivations so that we do what he wants us to do and we're thrilled to be doing it. And then after we do it, we, he gives us an award. You know, it's just like taking your kids boogie boarding and you sandwich them between you and the board and you ride in the wave and then you get done and say, you did such a great job there. <laughs> you know, that we, we stand before the Lord uh, he says, I'm coming quickly and, and my rewards are with me and we will be judged. And sometimes we use the phrase based on our time, our talents, and our treasures. Resources that the Lord's given us. And he's going to judge us all different because we're all, we kind of got a bloom where we're planted. And some people are given a, a larger platform in terms of their witness for Jesus Christ. Uh, the professional athlete, the politician, the whatever it might be. Uh, versus uh, somebody that, uh, that isn't. We're all given opportunities, but we're judged based on those opportunities. And we kind of see that when Jesus was with the disciples. He's in the temple. He's in an area one day where, uh, like we have our little agape box, they had a little treasury thing where you'd kind of put your shekels uh, in there. And uh, <clears throat> kind of interesting, it had a, like a fluted top. It was big and round and kind of funneled down. It was made of brass or bronze. So when you drop your coins in, it kind of made a little rattling sound. So if you wanted to really impress people, you could just keep throwing those coins in. Everybody noticed? And they called it sounding the trumpets because it was kind of in the shape of a, of a trumpet. So all of that's going on, a bit of hypocrisy with that and so forth. There's some people giving a lot of money into this thing. And Jesus is sitting there and says, watch this, as this little, little old lady walks, walks up. Recorded in Mark 12, 42, then one, one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which would be like, like a half a penny, which makes a quadrants. So he called his disciples uh, to himself and said to them, assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all of those who've given to the treasury. And there must be thinking, you're not real good at math, Jesus, because we've been counting the coins that some of these guys are throwing in. But he says, for they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had, her whole livelihood. Uh, God judges on a different economy of things. He says, this lady that put in a half a penny gave more than the people that maybe, maybe gave $1,000 that, that day. Because he knows what's behind it, what the resources are, and what we're doing with it. Read a, a very interesting article by a gal named Peggy Noonan uh, uh, a number of weeks ago. She's uh, co written a number of books with Christian authors like Chuck Colchin. She's been a presidential speech writer and uh, she's a syndicated columnist working in Manhattan when September 11th takes place. Uh, she's not there at the time, her life is spared. She describes the uh, being there uh, in the ensuing days, in the aftermath, when there's Basically, no one is working, everybody's on the streets, uh, but who is working is the firefighters, the rescue guys, the military guys, construction workers, 12-hour shifts, and they're, they're going in on these big trucks, do their 12 hours, come out again, and then she's describing this scene where what used to be the, the elite of Manhattan and the financial institutions of our country who appeared to be the movers and the shakers and the important people uh, of that community and of our world, find themselves being very useless uh, and standing on the side of the road. And all they can do is, is cheer and wave as these guys go, go in and out on their 12-hour shifts. And she writes this. She says, I looked around me at all of us who were cheering and, uh, and saw who we were, investment bankers, orthodontists, magazine editors, and my group, a lawyer, a columnist, a writer. We had been the kings and queens of the city, respected professionals in a city that respects its professional class. And this night, we were nobody. We were useless. 
All, of, all we could do was applaud the somebodies, the workers who, unlike us, had not been applauded much of their lives. I was so moved and oddly, I guess, grateful because they'd always been the people who ran the place, who kept it going. They just never got their due. And then she talks about the, the reversal that came to my, her mind that the last had become first and the first had become last. And she was reminded that's how it will be before Jesus Christ in the Bema seat. You know, we'll, we'll probably be amazed at, at the people that receive the largest awards, those crowns that the, the Lord will give out that day, the little old ladies that prayed continually and, and faithfully, and the people that we think were the, the big guys in the, in the kingdom of God. There's just going to be a lot of people on the side applauding people that we would not suspect because God judges and gives awards based on a different economy than, than you and I. Uh, and it's based on what does he entrust to us, to what degree, and then what do we do with it. And one day we'll stand before him. And Jesus reminds us of that here at the, at the end of the end of the, of the New Testament. There's a, a revelation which includes his various titles. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Uh, two are contrasting. A root is buried in the ground. A star is in the heavens where everyone can see. The root and the offspring of David is his Jewish national name. If you think about it, he is the root of David. David would come from him, and then he would come from David, which means he would existed for all eternity. Not just the Messiah, but the Messiah that had come from heaven. Because David came from him, and then later he would come from David. So that's his, his Jewish national name. In, in the Gospels, we think about so many that came to him that wanted to be healed and so forth, that would shout out, even the lepers, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. I recognize that you're the Messiah. Uh, and then the bright and the morning star speaks of his, certainly his humility, but his majesty, his, his glory, uh, the idea that... Uh, the, the bright and morning star is a phrase used uh, earlier in Revelation 2 to the overcomers of the church at Thyatira. Uh, reminds us of Numbers 24, 17, that the Messiah would be the star of the line of Jacob and a scepter for the line of Israel. And it applies that, uh, that uh, the, the dawn is just coming. Again, if you can picture yourself going through the tribulation and then reading this about Jesus at the end, or you live in one of those places in the world today, like two-thirds of the Christians around the world who are being persecuted for their faith, uh, again, reminding that, that there were more martyrs for their faith in the last century than all centuries combined. It's not getting better out there in the world for Christians. Uh, it's getting more difficult uh, and these, these words would be very meaningful. This is also the only time in this closing section where John takes a, a definite article and says, uh, Jesus is the star, the bright, the morning, and wants us to realize that uh, we can count on him no matter what's going on. Uh, no matter how dark it is, there's going to be a sunrise, and even before we can see the sunrise, we can see the morning star. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a place, a place where you were, you were so sick or there was something wrong that, man, if you could just get some little glimmer that, that I'm coming to the, <clears throat> the end of this thing, then <clears throat> it can mean all the difference in the world. And that's what, what uh, this title is meant to be for believers that, that need to know that Jesus Christ is their hope. <clears throat> He's also the, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. He's all that there is using titles here used by the prophet Isaiah, speaking of his, his, uh, again, his deity and his character. The third revelation that Jesus gives us about himself is a reminder of the blessing of entering, <coughs> entering the city. Those that do his commandments enter the city. Those that don't, that are outside, or <coughs> well, they're described in, in other ter <laughs> terminology. And again, it's quite a, quite a contrast. And I think it's like those that overcome. It's talking about all believers. All believers do his commandments. Again, that's what John says in writing his letter. Uh, he says, I know him and, uh, uh, and does not, uh, he who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. 
Lots of people say they're Christians, right? I mean, there's lots of people around the world that say they're Christians that, that don't have a clue about Jesus' life, what he said, his death, his resurrection, what the Holy Spirit can do in and through their lives, this concept of living for God and surrendering ourselves to him and so forth. They're all, all very foreign concepts. There's a lot of people that are simply Christians by culture because their parents or their grandparents were and so on and so forth. So John says, you know, there's a lot of people that say they're Christians, but I got to tell you, they're liars. Now, my mother, he would have gotten in trouble with my mother for using that word, but, uh, but he uses it several times in his epistle. Um, uh, pretty radical uh, uh, statement. But again, these are just big fishermen doing the best they can. I don't know if he's at a guy's conference when he's uh, writing this letter or what, but he says, there are a bunch of liars out there. Uh, and he says, because people that know the Lord, we've been forgiven of our sins. We love the Lord, and we're doing our best to do his commandments. And those are the ones going into the city. And, uh, but there are those that are, that are not going into the city, uh, and they're outside, and they're described as, as dogs, which is meant to be here uh, like a wild animal. It's a derogatory term. It's, uh, it stands for something that is despised. Also outside the city are, are those that are uh, involved in sorcery, which, uh, again, is uh, the Greek word pharmakia, which uh, speaks of those that use, use drugs, and especially hallucinogenic drugs for, for worship, which is uh, very common in Hinduism uh, and many other uh, uh, religions around the world, as well as, uh, as people that do it uh, recreationally. So, you know, we're, we're plagued with this, this whole thing of, of, of ice and some of the things that are going on. And if you've read much or studied much, and I, I've had guys come into my office because they know I had a drug background and had my testimony published in a magazine that went out to like a million people around the world or something at one point in time. And uh, they, no, it was a guidepost. It really, really did. I got letters and phone calls from people all over the world. My parents heard from people they hadn't heard in 40 years and go, isn't that your son? And, uh, you know, and, uh, but I had people showing up in my office after that for the next couple of years and uh, had some invites to go speak at some drug rehab places and stuff around the island. Uh, as a result of that, uh, which was a blessing. But I have had guys in my office come in and said, uh, I know your background, and I know you don't know me, but I just got to tell you my story real quick. Have you got a minute? Sure. And it's like, hey, I, I was with some guys. I was drinking one night, and, uh, and they wanted to, to do ice. I had never done anything like that in my life, and I'd had, a few, <laughs> I'd had a, few, a few beers or whatever he was drinking, decided to do it, and was completely addicted after one time. I emptied out, took my bank card, got every, every dime I could get, emptied out my checking account, did ICE the rest of my life, and kept doing it for 10 years. And I just got out of prison, and it took prison to get me the other way. It's, it's dangerous that's out there. It changes the, the, uh, the chemistry of the brain, and uh, it, that brings on the addiction. It breaks down the will to get out of it. But there's, a, there's a, the physical side, but there's a spiritual dimension. That's my point here, described here as sorcery. We don't think of people that are addicted to drugs as sorcerers. But the Bible makes a direct connection. There's a spiritual bondage. That's why we need to pray for people, your family members, and we could go around and share testimonies and stuff. There's probably hardly a family here that is not affected by, by, uh, by ice and what's going on uh, here in Hawaii but God can break it through and God can change. The God that spoke creation into existence can fix your brain. We had uh, a young guy that, was, um, that uh, uh, came in and was part of the church and was a, was a drummer and played in a, a reggae band. He was a really good drummer. He was like really loud. We built a plexiglass thing around him and then we even added padding to it. We kept trying to, we loved him and wanted to see the Lord uh, work, <laughs> work and he had the long dreads and the whole thing. And, uh, man, he was loud. I, I know he was driving people out of, out of the church, but we just wanted to see God work in his life. And he, he struggled. He'd fall back uh, into uh, using and then come back. And uh, it, it, it's, it wasn't just an instant deliverance, but God delivered him. And uh, at the ripe old age of about uh, 28, uh, he decided after being, started doing ice at 13. So he'd been doing ice for 15 years. And God totally delivered and set him free. And Decided he wanted to serve his country. Never graduated from high school, so the Marines wouldn't take him. That was his first choice. So he, he got into the Navy. The Navy would take him. 
Uh, so here he has basic training at 28. They called him Pops <laughs> at 28 because everybody else was 18 years old. And so Pops made it through, uh, through basic training, which he said was incredibly hard. Had one of the other, uh, <coughs> Brian Yamaji, one of the uh, uh, enlisted Marine guys who, was, <laughs> who took him through PT and tried to get him in shape so he could get through, which he, which he did. Uh, graduated, and uh, it's been a number of years. He's married, he's got a family, and he's a chaplain's assistant in the United States Navy. A guy that was addicted to ice for 15 years because God can change not only the physical dimensions of our bodies when he brings healing to us, he can, he can change the spirituality that's behind the drugs. And there is a spirit behind it that we need to pray for others. But these are the ones that in this condition are outside. They're outside the, uh, the city. Certainly that's not the only condition. Those that are sexually uh, immoral, that's a, that is practicing uh, sexual immorality as a lifestyle, murderers, idolaters, whoever loves and, and practices a lie. So a great contrast. We've read about the beauty of the city, but we've also uh, read about uh, the white throne judgment, the lake of fire. Uh, we've really seen it all in, in, in the book. Uh, Kathy was asking me, so what do you, <laughs> we've been, do, been in this for about 11 months. Uh, are you, are you, is it kind of a sad thing to finish a book? It's always a sad thing to finish this book. I have to tell you, it's kind of a relief. It hasn't been easy to get up here and talk about mass destruction of the planet and the, and the judgment of all mankind apart from faith in Jesus Christ week in and week out. And I applaud you guys. There's still somebody left in the church <laughs> by the time we, uh, we get to this. But there's certainly been the, the beauty and the, and the grace as well. Again, final revelations of Jesus reminds us that eternal life is given freely. This is a wonderful passage, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. So notice it's the Holy Spirit and who's the bride? The bride of Christ. It's us, New Testament believers. We, with the Holy Spirit, are to be saying to a world to, to, to come. Uh, it's interesting that the Bible ends on an invitation. An invitation to come and receive eternal life freely. Uh, notice it's, it's to those that thirst. In other words, they have to have a desire. It's really hard to save somebody that doesn't want to be saved. I mean, I, w I was in that condition for uh, a number of years, and I know that I had to reach a point where I wanted to be saved. You know, I wanted to be changed. I didn't want to be who I, who I was anymore and what, what really the drugs and everything else had made me. I wanted to be something different. I wanted transformation uh, and I wanted to be saved. And that's when people get saved. Um, I, I, we kind of did a study last week because of um, Easter. And I always like to throw in all the reasons, you know, why we should put our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and they are innumerable. And if you've ever seen somebody uh, in a debate, uh, debating uh, the existence of God versus the atheist, I've never been to one yet that I did not go away feeling really sorry for the atheist guy and praying for him because he's got nothing. I mean, he's got nothing in the debate. He has no logic. He has no science. He has no nothing. And the other guy, because it's when it's a PhD against a PhD, some of these guys are really good, a PhD against an 18-year-old in freshman biology. They are really good debaters, but you put them against another PhD, and um, it, it looks bad. It's like a man against a boy kind of a thing. They got nothing. Intellectually, it's there, but it's got to be more than that. It's for those that thirst, Jesus says here at the end. In Matthew 11, he says, Come to me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John 37, the one who comes to me, I will in no ways or no means cast out. But again, the role, the Holy Spirit working with us, the bride saying, Come a great invitation, a great relationship that we have to work with the Holy Spirit in bringing others to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Notice it's the waters of life, refers to eternal life, uh, and again, to be with the Lord forever in, in the heavenly city. Let's go on to three. There's a final rebuke from Jesus. I want to encourage you, these last two points are going to go very quickly. So if you're a little concerned, we're, we're going to be okay. Verse 18 and 19, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. 
If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in the book. So this is a final rebuke from, from Jesus, a warning to not add or take away from the book. And of course, it's talking here specifically, you could say, about the book of Revelation. But uh, again, it's, it's not a mystery that this is it. This is the last thing that's going to be recorded in terms of the, in terms of the New Testament. So I really think it's, it's speaking about this is it. There will be no more direct revelation from God after this. Now, we have general revelation. We can see him in the heavens. We can see creation uh, and so forth. But in terms of uh, very, what we call direct revelation, the person of Jesus Christ or the written word of God, this, this would be it when this is done. Again, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God will be fully equipped for everything, for all good works, for everything uh, in life. It's, it comes right from, from scripture. It's all God breathed, already established that the Old Testament is. Now we have Paul telling us that all of the New Testament is as well. The writer of Hebrews would tell us that God who in various times and uh, ways spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days, the last days, again, same context, spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. Jesus comes and speaks to us, direct revelation, gives us the gospels, raises up the apostles, the Holy Spirit inspires them, and now John in the end says, and this is it. There won't be anything else. God's word, in terms of its authority, ends right, uh, right here. Very important to see. The scriptures are completed at this point. And then the final rebuke includes some severe consequences because of its direct uh, revelation ending here. Anyone that adds to it or anyone that takes away from it, there's some very, some very severe things that will happen to, to them. And again, these are speaking to unbelievers, a removal from the book of life, from the holy city, from the, uh, the things written about in the book that we've been studying. And then two final reminders, verse 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So a final reminder that the time is coming quickly. It will come suddenly. Uh, and, uh, and certainly we're to live in that, that anticipation. Uh, and, and I just have to tell you, as a, as a young believer, when I first uh, got saved, and I was about, I was about 28, I figure I'm, I wasted a good 10, 12 years of my life in there from, you know, 16 to, uh, to, that, to that time, and um, wasn't, uh, wasn't good. And uh, when I first, when I finally came to the Lord, I I so firmly believe that the Lord could come at any time that uh, somebody asked me to share a little testimony at, a, at, at this little meeting. Maybe there were going to be like 30 people there. And I, I totally, if I just said, hey, could you kind of come up and just share a little testimony real quick here? Is everybody like, hey, yeah, I'd be thrilled with that. You know, most people are like, I'm never coming to church here again. That guy tried to make me stand up in the middle of this. But uh, that was, you know, I was like, I totally would not do it. And there's only one reason I did it. There's only one reason I did it. I thought that the Lord could come back at any time, and that could be it. It could be the one shot. It could be the one shot deal where I could actually stand up and tell people that I'd received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I did not want to stand before Jesus and go, I had one shot, and I said no. I just, <laughs> I just didn't want to do it. It's the only reason I did it, and I've been doing it ever since. Because we will. And it's all going to come very quickly. And it's all going to come very, very suddenly. Again, heaven is not just a destination. It's the motivation for why we decide to do what we do with our lives, with our education, decisions we make, how we raise our kids, how we spend our finances, who we work for, what we do for a job. All of those things is that um, we're to be like Abraham, just a pilgrim, man, <laughs> just live in a tent, <laughs> just, just make him a way through. Because, uh, I mean, he was given the land of Israel, Haratz Israel, the land of Israel. He's given to Abraham. He goes, yeah, but it's not really my home because I'm looking forward to a city whose builder and maker is God. 
and, uh, and we're to live that way as well. And then notice the final reminder is not just that he's coming quickly, but uh, what we might call the final prayer of the church, a request for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful way to, to end the Bible with a reminder that, hey, we need, the, we need the grace of God, and we need it in our lives every day. And as we, again, had that um, wonderful passage in Isaiah on Wednesday night and talking about the grace of God and, and how we need to grow in our understanding because we... I can, I've been walking with the Lord, I don't know how long, 30 years or something, and I can tell you, I, I feel like I've got just a, a glimmer. It's so easy to kind of go into this default thinking that somehow my performance has something to do with my relationship with the Lord and that he could love me more if I could do more, say more, do the right things, never miss a devotion. And uh, I love doing all those things and I want to serve the Lord and love my time with the Lord. It has nothing to do with my salvation. It has nothing to do with his love for me. And uh, I mean, are you with, like that with your kids? You really love them a lot when they obey you and you can't stand them when they uh, don't? Uh, don't answer that question. But God's not like that. God just loves us. That's, that's just it. It's a different kind of, we're not God. We don't think the same way. He's just, it's who he is. It's not performance-based. It's just his grace. And uh, when we come to the, the final of the final of everything, that's how the Bible ends, a reminder of God's grace. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your, your love and your mercy and your grace, your unearned unmerited favor. We can give the definition. I pray that we could grow to, to understand it. Because there's a lot of things in this life that we, we fail at, don't do right, things we'd love to do for you that we don't do, things we shouldn't do that, that we do. And Lord, but you never meant us to live a life of fear and condemnation in that sense, Lord. You've made us to live a life of knowing that you, you love us. And that uh, it's your grace that you've saved us, that you've called us, you've chosen us, election, all of those things that are meant to be a blessing to us. Lord, and I pray that we might hear the exhortation that Jesus is coming suddenly, he will come suddenly, and we're to be about your business, living our lives as a pilgrim in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. We're the bride, giving that wonderful invitation to those around us to come. Come, are you thirsty? Lord, help us to find thirsty people that we can extend Your the love is Love.